And um, <laughs> I think we're going to be good to go. So today we'll be hearing from Paul McKenzie. Paul McKenzie um, is an area agent um, based out of Vance. He actually used to be our agent here in Durham many agents ago, which is super fun because uh, there is a rock out in the front garden that we refer to as Paul's Rock because it is from Paul's farm. Um, and he is a wonderful, wonderful delight. We are so excited to have him. And with that, Paul, I will just let you take it away. Well, thank you. That was a very nice introduction, but I, I, um, I thought I sent you the, the theme song and the special effects <laughs> were supposed to play uh, before. Okay. Next time, next time. Next time, next time. It would be like a Superman theme song. I just want to be clear on that. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I am uh, very pleased to be with you this morning. <clears throat> uh, I do want to uh, clarify one thing up front. I am not accustomed, even on Zoom, to showing up for work in a t-shirt, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm recovering from some surgery, and uh, I can't change my own shirt, so <laughs> this is what you get. I did tell uh, Paul yesterday, it was the first time I had ever seen him not in a button-up, and it was a little bit... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, who is this guy? Um, but I, I, I am wearing one with buttons, in the front at least, so a little more formal, maybe. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm very pleased to be with you. Uh, have very, very fond memories of Durham County working there and the Master Gardener. You have, you guys have a wonderful, amazing Master Gardener pro program there. Um, so glad to be with you. So I guess you just want me to jump on in here. Um, here. I'm getting there. Uh, how's that, Ashley? Well, it's great. Okay. Uh, shout out Charlotte Glenn, uh, our NC State Extension Master Gardener uh, coordinator um, definitely drew on work that she had done when she was an agent back in uh, years ago uh, in putting together this presentation. But errors and omissions are my own. Um, and I'm going to be talking a lot about um, integrated pest management, and I'm actually going to be talking a lot about pesticides. And, you know, that's a topic that uh, people have strong opinions about, people have strong feelings about. Uh, there is a lot of misinformation about pesticides. And so I think it, a legitimate question is, <laughs> who is this guy that's going to talk to you about this? Um, so just a little bit of background. I've been an extension agent uh, since 1996, started in Harnett County, went to Durham, now I'm in Vance and Warren. Before that, I worked for three years in the pesticide industry, and it was incredibly um, uh, informative and helpful, uh, you know, just a great, great learning experience. And in my role as an extension agent uh, over the last however long it's been, um, I've done uh, training for uh, pesticide applicators. So uh, commercial pesticide applicators, applicators and farmers uh, are required to get continuing education. And uh, so I've, I've done the training for them. So, you know, all that means, you know, I've tried to kind of stay up to speed on, on what's happening and, and the issues and all that kind of good stuff. And um, one of the things as an extension agent, you have unparalleled opportunities for on-the-job training and continuing education. So I've benefited greatly from that. And so here's the bottom line. Uh, in the end, here's what I want you to leave with. Um, so I guess after these next few slides, if you wanna, if you wanna log off, you've <laughs> actually says no, um, but uh, here, here's the bottom line. You know, I, I've been to, you know, scores or hundreds of sites over the years to look at pest issues. 
Uh, and the vast majority of problems were avoidable. And I'll talk in depth about all the things that you can and should do to avoid pest problems. And when you are trying to solve pest problems, uh, it can be very tricky. You know, the typical scenario is you see something like this and you take a leaf to the garden center. And, you know, especially in a place like Durham and Raleigh and, and even where I am, we've got some great garden centers and some very knowledgeable people. Uh, but even going to your extension agent or your master gardener, uh, you know, when you're looking at just one leaf that somebody brings in or even a stem or a branch, um, it, it's it's very, very challenging oftentimes to try and diagnose things. Um, <clears throat> oops, but it's just crucial, went too fast there, to start with an accurate diagnosis. Uh, you know, so we look at something like this. Um, and it's been a long, it's been a while since I put these slides together. So I'm blanking on what this particular pest problem is. It, it looks like it's probably powdery mildew, uh, but, and I don't even remember what the crop is, but, um, you know, there's insects that produce, uh, you know, there's the woolly, um, woolly aphids that produce, you know, kind of a, a snowy colored frass or whatever, or, or exudation, um, you know, and, and there could be multiple issues going on with this plant. Um, there could be sooty molds uh, from, from an aphid infestation or a whitefly infestation. Um, so it's just really crucial to start with an accurate diagnosis before you go for a control measure. I also want to leave you with um, the perspective that these can all be valuable tools in maintaining our gardens and landscapes and even natural areas uh, and our agricultural crops. Uh, we, we need these things. I mean, we need these things. You know, one of the huge issues that we have uh, in this day and age is invasive pests. And in many, many situation, uh, situations, the best tool we have for managing invasive pests is, you know, in the case of, um, you know, Ligustrum or Kudzu or uh, Tree of Heaven, you know, pesticides are, are very helpful. In the case of the emerald ash borer or, uh, you know, we have the new emerging spotted lanternfly uh, and others, uh, these can be really important tools. So they are valuable tools for us. And I am going to argue, and I, I sincerely believe, and I hope you'll come away with this, that they can be used safely. Uh, and the, the biggest part of using them safely is following the directions. And the directions are there for a reason. I'm going to give you a picture of everything that goes into developing those instructions. Uh, it's it's a lot more than you might think, um, but but if we do follow those, you know there's there's reasons, scientific reasons for everything that's on that label, um, as far as how to apply it, where to apply it, um, how to protect yourself, how to protect the environment, and and if we follow those, they can be used safely. Um, but, and here's the big but. Uh, they should be used sparingly, correctly, and as a last resort. Um, so <clears throat> that's the bottom line. That's what I want you to leave with. And by the way, um, I will mention that uh, on the outside chance you'd like to review these slides later, I will provide a link at the end. This is a, a Google slide presentation, and I'll provide you with a, a link where you can get to it. And I kind of like to start with this question, and I think I'll stop my share so that I can see everyone. And either by a show of hands or, you know, with the raise hand reaction feature uh, on Zoom, how many of you would claim that you do not use pesticides? How many of you would claim that you do not use pesticides? Okay, I see couple of hands, a hand, uh, 
a handful of hands. Okay, all right, that, that's a, a pretty typical um, response from when I've done these. Um, so uh, am I back showing my screen, Ashley? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so <clears throat> I, I won't ask you to, um, you know, revise your answer or anything, but, um, you know, those of you who, who say that you don't use pesticides, I would ask you to just think about, um, do you use Roundup or any weed killers? And if you use any weed killers of any kind, uh, even, you know, some of the, the natural weed killers, then you are in fact using pesticides. If you use a weed and feed in your lawn uh, for controlling crabgrass or broadleaf weeds, then you are in fact using pesticides and need to use all the appropriate care. <clears throat> if you use any ant and roach spray, if you use wasp spray, uh, if you, you know, use anything, you know, if you've got a, a, a yellow jacket's nest under a, a shrub and you go out and you spray it um, with a wasp and hornet spray, uh, if you use um, roach or ant bait stations, uh, if you use any of those things, uh, you are in fact using a pesticide. If you use this product <laughs> or anything that's sold as, you know, uh, under the, that safer brand, well, maybe not anything, but, uh, you know, this, this is a pesticide. It, it is classified as a pesticide and, and goes through all the same uh, rules and regulations and, and necessary precautions uh, as other products. It happens to be a very low toxicity pesticide and one that, uh, uh, you know, is a, a great choice in many situations because of that, but it is, a, it is a pesticide. If you have pets and you use any kind of flea treatment, uh, flea collar, uh, flea shampoo, uh, the we use the front line on our on our dogs uh, that goes on their backs. Those, in fact, are pesticides. If you use insect repellent, <laughs> um, those, in fact, are also pesticides. So what I find is, you know, Typically, I have a when I do this presentation, I have a few people that answer, "No, I never use pesticides." But then, when you stop and think about it, and you really consider the broad definition, in fact, most people do use pesticides. Now, one of the common uh, points of confusion, and and even extension agents sometimes make this mistake, um, uh, is we use the term pesticide when we're referring to, referring to insect control products. And in fact, pesticide um, is a chemical that controls pests, including weeds, fungi, bacteria, insects, uh, rodenticides, um, et cetera. So pesticide is the broad category and it includes all of those things. Um, so again, that's a common misconception that when we use the term pesticide, we're only talking about things that kill insects. But in fact, pesticide is, is the big category and then we have all these subcategories. All right, so true or false, organic gardeners do not use pesticides. Um, and I suspect by now most of you would correctly answer that as false. Um, well, and I guess it's a matter of preference, but but certainly organic farmers and many organic gardeners do use pesticides, but they use pesticides that are naturally derived. They are still pesticides. And in fact, um, one of the pesticides that used to be labeled 
uh, as allowed in uh, organic production because it is naturally derived uh, is highly toxic and toxic to pollinators and, and other beneficial insects. And so even though it's naturally derived, it's no longer allowed under the organic rules. Um, that's a product called rotenone, which is made from chrysanthemums. Um, so yes, in fact, organic gardeners do use pesticides. And there's an example. Uh, some of them are quite toxic, you know, and, and of course that's a choice that a gardener, an individual gardener can make and hopefully gardeners do. And I, I'll argue for this is that you need to choose the ones that are low toxicity. Um, uh, but even some of the organic products can have off target impacts and they are subject to the same laws. Now, the laws have changed a little bit in recent years and there are some products on the shelf that um, don't go have to go through the full pesticide registration process. And uh, I forget how they're categorized. Um, do you know what I'm talking about, Ashley? I forget the term they use for that. Um, yeah. But basically it, it's products that they've determined are such low risk that um, you know they're, they're allowed to market them without going through the, the whole registration process. Um, but we do need to use them with the same caution, uh, which means reading the instructions and, and following them. So, so I'm going to talk about integrated pest management and, and what that means. And, and hopefully it's a, a concept that you're at least um, uh, somewhat familiar with. And I always like to start with this quote uh, from Elliot Coleman, you know, considered father of organic gardening. Uh, and this came out of his magazine back in 1998. Um, and this, this, is, this is the strategy that I think we need to use is that when we're seeing pest issues, then the solution is to focus on correcting the growing conditions whenever we can. Um, and and that's that's the philosophy that I think we need to have as gardeners and as master gardeners when we're dealing with the public. Um, you know, there is certainly the customers that will come to you, and the first words out of their mouths is, "What can I spray for?" Fill in the blank, and you know, we want to try to answer that and we want to answer it correctly and we want to answer it uh, with uh, a, a chemical if that's appropriate, that's safe and, and effective. Um, but we, we also want to take advantage of those teachable moments to talk about, hey, what are the growing conditions on the site? Have you done a soil sample? Uh, you know, is the plant growing in the correct location uh, for uh, for it to thrive, um, you know, do you have poorly drained soils, and that's compounding the issue? So, we want to try to have those conversations as well. Um, these are the principles of integrated pest management according to Paul. <laughs> so, for whatever that's worth, um, and the first principle is prevent, and then we want to monitor identify, assess, and then decide on the countermeasures if, if any are needed. And I'll talk about each of these uh, in some detail. And again, you can uh, access these slides later if you want to. Uh, but these two starred ones are the most important, prevention and monitoring. Um, that's kind of the, the foundation of all of integrated pest, pest management. And there's a lot of things we can do for pest prevention. And, and I hope these are things that have kind of already been introduced to you as you've started Master Gardener Volunteer Training. Ashley, I'm not even sure where they are in the class. Um, how far along are you? So this is our seventh week, I believe. They've had entomology, they've had plant pathology. So they've, oh, great. luckily I just saw in the chat, someone started to say like, oh, I'm noticing a theme, like the plants have to be happy. I'm like. <laughs> yeah. Good, 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 good. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, that's helpful. Thanks, Ashley. And you know, one of the one of the most important things we can do with pest prevention is is with plant selection. Uh, and and so recognizing the fact that if we plant roses, you know, if if we just absolutely got to have roses in our landscape. There are certain types of roses where if you spray them, you will have, you are guaranteed practically to have black spot and aphids and white flies and, uh, and mites, and you will have to treat them. Uh, and there are other uh, types of roses where those things are less problematic. Uh, but if you plant uh, knockout roses, you're at risk of getting um, that viral disease um, that's called what, Ashley? Rose rosette. We saw it Rose last rosette. Week. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so acknowledging those, those risks uh, and you can always make the decision, you know, well, maybe there's another plant that will be just as showy uh, and meet those can, you know, the growing, the right growing conditions and, uh, or, or as matched to the growing conditions on the site, uh, but does not have those risks. Uh, so you can make that, that choice. If you want to produce a consistent crop of high quality apples, you have to treat for scale and frog eye leaf spot and a myriad of other diseases and the spray program for producing a consistent crop of high quality apples is intense and complicated and requires specialized equipment. So maybe instead of apples, you grow blueberries or figs or some other crop that uh, is less prone to insect and disease issues. Leyland cypress, uh, it's basically an inv invitation to a wide variety of insect and disease problems. And of course, hopefully everyone knows that it's no longer even recommended by uh, extension agents and, and nor, nor many others in, in the horticulture industry. Um, uh, turf grass, selecting the species that's adapted to the site. Um, and is, is going to do well for those growing conditions. Um, tomatoes, uh, if it, you know, there's a wide range of, of cultivars available. If you want to grow uh, the the heirloom cultivars, then yeah, you're at higher risk of a wide variety of disease issues. So, so there's a lot you can do just from plant selection. Uh, here's an example out of one of the garden seed catalogs for a cucumber cultivar, you know, and we're used to looking for disease resistance in our tomato cultivars, but there's other crops that also have disease resistance and those are indicated by these letters here. So this particular cultivar happens to be resistant to cucumber mosaic virus, something that's abbreviated CVYV and powdery mildew. I don't know what that stands for. Um, so, you know, again, plant selection is 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 very important. Uh, and you know, for for many many years, as an extension agent, you know, these were the go to references, and they're still good references to go to when it comes to plant selection. And, and there's others as well. These are ones that I am. 99% certain are somewhere in your office and probably in your in your master gardener office there in Durham County. And, and they're they're great, great references. And, and, and again, there's many others when it comes to plant selection. Um, now that Southern Gardener's book of lists is probably a little dated, I have to say. <clears throat> and I hope that you've all started to become familiar with this amazing amazing reference tool, the North Carolina Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox. Have you guys already been playing with this, Ashley? Great, yeah. So um, this is just 
I mean, this has only been developed in the last five years or, or less, and it, it's, it's phenomenal uh, what you can do here as far as plant selection. Um, I routinely, when I get a phone call from someone, uh, go to the find a plant function and start narrowing down parameters based on, you know, how much space they have and whether it's sun or shade or uh, do they want something that blooms at a certain time of year and, and help them narrow down the options um, so that they can find something. And then there's usually some narrative information in the description of each plant that talks about uh, pests and diseases. By the way, Michael Durr, actually, do your, do your uh, folks still come into the office to, to do a hotline? They do at times. Um, yeah. I'm curious about what you're going to say about Michael Durr. That's the one book that we do have, you guys, but it's in my office because I liked it so much. I commandeered it. Um, <laughs> Shame on you, Ashley. <laughs> I know, but I just love it. <laughs> well, next time you're in the office. <laughs> it's in my office. <laughs> go see Ashley and politely ask her if you can borrow that book. It, it, it's, it's I, I don't know what to say about it. It's not, you know, it's not something that you read cover to cover, but just turn to a random page and read the description of the plants. It, it, it's it's incredibly informative and it's also quite entertaining as well. Um, he he, uh, Michael Durr is a, I think he's a professor emeritus from University of Georgia, um, and um, the narrative. And some of the plant descriptions is, is quite entertaining, but but it's all there as far as like, you know, don't plant this because of this reason, or you know, this is a great plant for this site, or uh, uh, you know, if you plant this, these are some of the common issues. But again, you know, a lot of that information is in the the plant toolbox. I, I will say, you know, this 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 tool. Our, our toolbox, it, it's a phenomenal resource. resource. It's, it's not perfect. Um, I mean, nothing ever is. Um, but, uh, you know, don't be hesitate. Don't hesitate to kind of look in more than one place for information about a plant. Um, so, you know, no brainer. Don't plant bananas. Uh, if you want consistent banana production, you know, th that's a tropical plant. So, uh, again, just just plant selection, uh, and then another way that we can prevent pests is, of course, through uh, plant placement. Making sure if it's a shady area, we're growing things that are adapted to that site. Uh, uh, if uh, 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 if this is our our planting location, <laughs> you know, and you're going to try to grow a tree in that. It's just not going to do well. I mean, it's actually kind of phenomenal that those survived as long as they did. They did finally get removed, but um, you know they're they're not going to perform well. So we got to put the right plant in the right spot. Um, and then another way we prevent pest issues is by installing plants correctly. And uh, if you haven't had it at some point, you'll get detailed information about tree and shrub installation and, and other installation uh, techniques. But uh, this is a plant that came into the Durham County Extension Office probably back in 1998. You know, why did this tree die, you know, a few months after I planted it? And, you know, there was no root growth that came out of that root ball. Uh, I mean, just, just none. It's like... It, they just pulled it out and I mean, you can maybe see a little bit of root growth, um, but but that was installation issue, you know, and, and that's always a question that I ask when I'm dealing with a tree or a shrub issue. Um, that's usually the first question I ask is how old is it or when was it planted? And certainly if a tree or a shrub was planted in the first year, it's highly unlikely that there's any kind of insect or disease issue that has caused a problem that, that quickly. Uh, if 
a tree or a shrub has been planted in the last five years, it's still a line of inquiry. Um, because if it was planted too deeply, if it was over mulched, um, if the soil wasn't loosened, if they didn't get a soil sample, uh, if if they you know you know didn't do a good job to correct drainage issues, those problems may show up you know three to five years after planting, but but that's still what it goes back to. Um, and planting too deep is, is an all too common issue we see with trees and shrubs. Um, so with this tree, we should be seeing the, the, the trunk flare at the bottom and we don't see that. Uh, so what I do if I'm, if I come to a situation like this, I'm going to dig around in the mulch at the base of that trunk to see uh, was it planted too deep or was it over mulched? And it was one or the other, um, but that'll tell me something about what's going on there. Um, so again, if you, you see see a plant that's not doing well within, you know, even up to five years after planting, plant installation is suspect. So we've got to do a good job with soil preparation, soil sampling, correcting drainage issues, all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, proper spacing, knowing what the mature size is, uh, you know, in the case of, you know, annuals like vegetables and flowers, proper spacing can improve air movement through the crop so that we're less likely to have high humidity, which is favorable to insect and disease issues. <clears throat> um, and then another big component of installation is proper care. That's something that hopefully you'll continue to learn as you go through the training, uh, that we're using mulch properly. Mulch is great, but it can be overdone. I actually, when I was working in Durham, actually one time I went out to a site where they were having issues and they had probably eight to 10 inches of mulch piled up in their beds. It, it was bizarre. Um, but over, as I said, over mulching is, is an all too common issue. Proper fertilization, keeping things healthy. Um, have you all uh, talked about uh, soils? Hopefully you did that on the first class. Yeah, so. yeah John Havlin came and oh, told perfect. us what was up. Yeah, excellent. That's what my master gardeners are learning about today from John Havlin, so. Yeah. Proper pruning. Um, and, and this is not proper pruning in case there was any question in your mind. Now, granted, you know, this is a tough situation. This was a, a, a crepe myrtle that was planted in the wrong location room. And so they don't really have any choice. They're trying to make it so people can walk down the sidewalk and it's not interfering with power lines and people can see the storefronts. So they're kind of between a rock and a hard place uh, with with trying to prune that thing. But, um, you know, you do something like that to a crepe myrtle year after year after year, and it's certainly going to lose attractiveness and, and probably eventually start to decline. Uh, proper irrigation, uh, irrigation method, irrigation amount, soil applied irrigation keeps the foliage dry so that you're less likely to have uh, fungal uh, growth on the foliage, fungal diseases. In a vegetable garden, if you're not doing crop rotation, you're just inviting problems. And even if, if you have an annual color bed, um, you know, if you're going to be planting pansies in the same location year after year after year, uh, you know, you're increasing the risk of, uh, you know, developing soil-borne diseases that could eventually make that site unsuitable for pansies and other crops. So we got to do crop rotation. Uh, and then another part of prevention is where we can attracting and conserving beneficial insects. This happens to be a little soldier beetle that's a, a predator insect. And so diversity is uh, one of the keys to attracting and conserving beneficials, I think. Um, 
Uh, so this is a wonderful view of uh, the pollinator paradise garden in Chatham County that my great friend and colleague Debbie Roos uh, built and, and maintains as a demonstration garden. Well worth the visit if you've never been there. Um, but the amount of diversity with respect to beneficial insects we have in that site is, is phenomenal. Um, and so this is a, a location in Warren County. Um, I forget the name of this. It's a pretty cool little site where they have musical performances. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously this is a very old, uh, very formal architecture. And so the landscape understandably is very formal, uh, but the risk there is that we've got very little diversity. And if one of these uh, shrubs starts succumbing to, you know, nematodes or root rot or something like that, uh, you know, that's very difficult to deal with. So, you know, we're putting all our eggs in one basket there. Uh, you know, you certainly wouldn't base your retirement plans on a single stock. Uh, or at least I hope you wouldn't. I'm not a financial planner. <laughs> little little caveat there. Um, but, uh, you know, so th there's a trade-off there. Yeah, you want the formal landscape. Sometimes we're trying to uh, duplicate the history of a site but um, that's risky. Sanitation is an important part of um, pest prevention. Years ago, I went to a, a tomato greenhouse where a guy had a very successful tomato growing operation in a greenhouse and he was growing the tomatoes in the ground Oh, and by the way, this is not a tomato leaf. I, I do know that. <laughs> There's a lot that I don't know, but um, I, I do know this is not a tomato leaf. Uh, but anyway, my story, um, uh, he was very successful raising tomatoes in the ground of the greenhouse, you know, not in pots, just tilling up the soil every year, uh, and was doing it year after year after year. And I just told you how important rotation was. And he was not using crop rotation in that greenhouse. But what he was doing is he was being just super, super diligent about sanitation. And so he was you know, walking through the greenhouse on a regular basis, clipping out disease leaves and like not dropping them on the ground. I mean, he was like putting them in a bag or something and getting them out of the greenhouse. Uh, doing a real good job of cleanup at the end of the season. And he was using a lot of other strategies as well. But sanitation was a big component of that and allowed him to overcome, at least for some period of time, the limitations of, of not rotating. Uh, oh, and so what this is, uh, I believe this is frog eye leaf spot on uh, on apple trees. So, you know, if you're if you're growing apples or some fruit crop, cleaning up rotten fruit that falls on the ground, cleaning up, you know, limbs and leaves that fall on the ground. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to be out there, you know, with a, uh, a, a leaf vacuum every time something falls, but certainly at the end of the season, uh, do a good job of cleaning up the orchard or, or the growing area where you have those fruit, fruit crops planted and not leaving dead and diseased material on the ground in the plant, et cetera. Here's another example. This is a twig girdler, twig girdler. Um, I'm not sure if this is pecan or walnut, uh, but this is a little beetle that um, uh, lays its eggs in, in the tip of the branch and it then chews around the outside of the branch until the branch falls off. It, it looks just like somebody has gone through your, you know, pecan tree and, and clipped off the edges of the branches with, with hand clippers. Uh, but when you see those branch tips laying on the ground, uh, cleaning those up, because that's where the insect eggs are, 
Uh, so that's a very effective method to reduce pest problems with this particular pest. If we were in person, I would ask you what this is, what this uh, orange thing is, and you, I would get answers like rototiller. Um, those are accurate. Another description of this, this device is a uh, machine to transfer insect and disease and weed propagules from one site to another. <laughs> So if I don't clean that tiller, uh, when I move it, get the uh, uh, dirt and debris off of that tiller. Am I still with you? I just got an unstable message. Yeah, we I still got you. Crazy. Okay, great. Um, what was I saying? Um, yeah, so Cleaning if, I don't, that, if okay. I don't clean that tiller, thank you. If I don't clean that tiller, then I'm going to potentially transfer weed seeds, fungal spores, insect eggs from one site to another. Uh, you know, this is one of the big ways that fire ants get moved around is uh, earth moving equipment uh, doesn't get cleaned moving from site to site. Um, so that's the the pest prevention component of integrated pest management and that's the foundation it's absolutely the foundation and then the second step is to monitor by the way ashley are there any questions that have come up um there are but we've been having fun answering them so um we've been working on our skills of answering questions which is great okay good <laughs> I haven't been paying attention, so I'll go back and review them later. It's about, um, you know, do perennials need to be moved as part of a crop rotation? Or um, if a plant is really failing to thrive someplace, is it better to move it or to just get a new one for the new spot? And our answer was kind of um, okay to move things, but do it at the right time and move things to new spots. And sometimes they perk up, but sometimes if you just destroyed the form of it, like a tree, or an evergreen or something like that. Maybe start with a new one. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. All right, so step two is monitoring. And so much of, uh, so, so much of our pest issues can be resolved if we just catch them early. And, and they're so much easier to, to deal with if we can catch them early. So this is, uh, I believe this is Euonymus scale, which is a little insect that you hopefully learned about, at least speaking in, in your entomology class, um, uh, that, you know, attaches itself to the leaf. Uh, but, you know, it's not like this shows up overnight. Um, by the way, as a master gardener, when you're dealing with the public, Always be skeptical of when someone starts with all of a sudden, uh, because with plants, that is rarely the case, has been my experience. It's not a never kind of thing, but but it's pretty rare. All of a sudden generally means it's been there for a long time and I just didn't notice it because I wasn't paying attention. Um, so this is a, uh, you know, this is a problem that developed over, I don't know, weeks or months, perhaps. Uh, and it, it just didn't get noticed. But if it had been noticed early on, then instead of having to go out and buy some horticultural oil or, uh, you know, whatever product they wanted to use, they could have just clipped out the infective leaves and stems, uh, or the infested, I should say, leaves and stems, and been done with it before it spread so extensively. And, and even at this point, it's possible that you know, just clipping this out would, would be effective. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, cabbage worms and, you know, cabbages and broccolis and, and other of our coal crops, uh, those little caterpillars start out very, very tiny. I mean, you think about how big their little eggs are, and then those eggs hatch, 
And so just from the size of the egg, you know that caterpillar is going to start life super tiny. Um, and it's going to start to feed and the holes will be kind of small. But uh, there's this point in, in its life cycle where just all of a sudden it's growing like crazy and therefore it's eating like, you know, vast amounts of foliage. And so, again, all of a sudden the caterpillars showed up. No, they've been there for a while, but they were small and they weren't eating a lot. But if we'd been paying closer attention, then we could have caught them early and, you know, maybe flick them off with a fingernail or um, hit them with some diapel early on in the life cycle before they caused a lot of damage and, you know, really messed up our production. This is the uh, eggplant lace bug. Um, when I first saw this, I was didn't even know there was an eggplant lace bug, but uh, um, you may be familiar with azalea lace bugs, and this is a uh, close, uh, close cousin or whatever. Um, and, you know, they're small. And this is the case with a lot of our insect pests is they're small and they like to hide in nooks and crannies and crevices. And they're easy to miss if we're not paying attention. So uh, for a sense of scale, you can probably tell but it's you know, maybe 16th of an inch long, something like that, maybe an eighth of an inch. Same is true with disease issues. Um, I think this, I, I diagnosed this, and I, I didn't actually see this. I was just going by symptoms, but I think I diagnosed this as most likely um, downy mildew um, on uh, uh, this, this cucurbit crop. Um, but, uh, you know, that's something where paying attention, catching things early and you know in agriculture there's a whole system for monitoring uh and we call it scouting where uh, and there's actually you know there'll be extension specialists or university um researchers that will develop a regime for scouting for a particular pest on a particular crop and it will be something like go out into the cotton field and walk in a zigzag pattern zigzag pattern and stop every 20 feet and look for this pest and count and do that you know x number of times and keep record of how many insects you see of a specific type and if you see this number of insects then yes you should treat but if it's below that number then no you shouldn't and the, the rationale behind that that is economic. You know, we don't want to spend uh, two hundred dollars an acre. That's probably uh, not an accurate picture, but you don't want to spend you know fifty dollars an acre treating something if the yield loss is only going to cost you twenty five dollars um, an acre. Um, so, so that's the that's the principle behind scouting in a in an agricultural situation. And, uh, but, uh, so we don't have that kind of data in a typical garden situation, but what we can do is we can just get in the habit of being observant. And as gardeners, we are observant, um, but, you know, once a week or twice a week, walking around your garden and landscape and looking closely at things, pulling weeds when they first germinate, uh, looking for those insect pests um, and, you know, taking note of where they are and keeping the hand printers in the back pocket so that you can uh, clip out a, a diseased leaf or uh, a, a section of a plant that's started to have an in insect infestation. Um, so that's, that's an important foundation of integrated pest management. And then we've got to identify what we're dealing with if we do see a pest, if we're if we're going out and we, we've done everything we can to prevent, and then we're going out and keeping an eye on things through monitoring, uh, and, and but then for all of our efforts, we do see something uh, that we don't know what it is. And it's so important to identify the problem. And, you know, this is very typical scenario. 
uh, that we deal with an extension where somebody has this type of problem where they've got a shrub and, and the leaves are dying and they think they can solve this with a spray <laughs> and they think that they can bring in a leaf or even a branch and we, we can tell them you know what's going on and what they can spray on the foliage to fix it and in a case like this of course that's not going to work this is a, a soil root problem and the only way we're going to uh, determine for sure what it is is with some a uh, little bit of digging literally and figuratively um, uh, you know, so here was an issue. I went out to the landowner. This is actually a, actually a forestry situation. And he was seeing these symptoms on lots of different trees. And his concern was that there had been an aerial uh, herbicide application on a, a property nearby and that there was drift. Uh, but this was... Um, freeze or cold damage you know there was a late freeze and um so we, we've got to properly identify problems before we take action um i literally had a phone call with someone one time and they had tried one they they had some type of you know pest issue uh, or plant issue they tried one product no result tried another product no result tried another product no result i mean they literally spent money on three different products um, instead of just starting with an extension agent or a master gardener and getting an identification so that they could have um, uh, selected the right product. Um, so why is the turf dying here? Uh, and, you know, this is the challenge sometimes when we're dealing with the public is we're talking to somebody on the phone or you know you're sitting at a farmer's market doing a, a plant clinic or an information table uh, or some festival or whatever doing some outreach and you're not seeing the full picture you can probably guess you know the issue here is shade and root competition from the tree um, so we got to ask lots of questions to try to figure out you know what's the big picture so that we can do the best we can to identify what the issues issue is and then you know the other thing is to keep in mind is that these types of problems nutritional viral in some cases even insect issues can have very similar symptoms uh, on a plant and so you know you can't make assumptions um, we really got to now. there's some things that you'll learn to recognize and, you know, you'll learn some diagnostic techniques and, and you'll be able to, you know, there's some things that are very common and, but, you know, with, with things that you're not sure about, um, you know, it, it takes some, some investigation. Magnification, magnification is a fantastic tool for diagnosis. And uh, so you know, getting a hand lens or a magnifying glass, you know, even something that's 510x magnification can give you a lot of insight into what you're seeing from the standpoint of, you know, insect issue. You know, there's insects that you that are really hard to see with the naked eye or that are hard to identify with the naked eye. You know, there's fungal issues um, and other things. Uh, you know, where just 510X magnification can really help. Um, the other thing that, uh, as far as magnification is, uh, and especially if you're trying to get help from uh, an extension agent or another resource, is taking a picture of things. Uh, a lot of your modern smartphones have a macro mode which on my phone here is this little tulip icon. And that's a pretty standard type of icon that indicates the macro mode on your phone. Now, uh, folks who have nicer phones than me, which is probably most of you, um, it may be automatic. Some of the you know modern uh, 
top of the line model phones will do this automatically. Um, but what the macro mode allows you to do is it allows you to take a picture of something while holding the phone camera, you know, an inch or two away from the subject. And that's going to give you a much better picture of what you're seeing, uh, whether it's an insect or disease or weed seedling, um, where you'll be able to make out more detail. Um, you know, pinch to zoom is not actually zooming, it's, it's cropping. And when you do that, you're losing resolution. Uh, so uh, using that macro mode on your phone and get, get your phone as close to the subject as you can. With good lighting, you have to be careful that you're not shading the subject uh, with your phone getting that close. Um, but uh, getting a good close up photo can be really helpful. Um, and sending that into your extension agent or the, or the client can give it, show, share it with you. And uh, so that's really helpful. Um, you know, there's still a role for uh, things like this. Our uh, problem solver type reference books that you probably have in the office. Uh, and there's never a bad time to take a soil sample, um, you know, if you, I'm, I'm sure you learned from Dr. Havlin uh, the importance of proper nutritional and chemical environment for your plants. Uh, and there's just no substitute for soil sampling. Uh, if nothing else, it can rule things out. But pH and, and phosphorus deficiencies in particular can be very problematic. And we also have an option as far as diag diagnostic tools to um, send samples to the NC State Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. And uh, this is a lab based on campus. Have you guys talked about this, Ashley? Yeah, Matt um, presented, Matt Bertone presented for our entomology section. But if you wanted to talk about like how to actually do good samples, I feel like that can never be talked about enough. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So typically if you're in the office or doing some kind of outreach, you know, plant clinic, whatever, somebody's going to bring you a leaf, you know, from a plant and say, what's wrong with my plant? And they'll bring you a leaf from like, you know, an oak tree or something, you know? And so you're supposed to try and guess what's happening, you know, seeing, you know, 0.1% of the total plant. Uh, and, it's always difficult and, and oftentimes impossible to do that. So when we're talking about sampling a plant, more material, the better. This happens to be a, a tobacco plant, of course, I'm also the field crop agent in uh, Vance County. So this was a tobacco issue that I was uh, looking at, but I got the whole plant and which is what I needed to get. And not only that, I got uh, some soil from the plant. You know, I, I wanted the whole root system, stems, foliage, everything. Now, obviously you're not gonna do that. You know, you're not gonna send in a whole, you know, maple tree or whatever, um, but having the proper type of sample is important. So with turf, uh, if you're trying to do diagnosis that's going to the clinic, then you want, a plug that has the, you know, like a four inch cube that has soil, roots, foliage, the whole nine yards. Um, if you're doing, you know, marigold, ask the client to dig up three or four of the plants. Um, you also want to keep the, um, the dirt from the plant off of the foliage. So it's a good idea to wrap up the root system in a plastic bag so that the dirt doesn't get on the, on the top portion of the plant. Um, now in the case of a, a tree or a shrub or something like that, um, if we're sending in a sample, we wanna uh, have dead foliage, healthy foliage, and then in between foliage and not just foliage, but stems. And then we also need roots and soil as well. So we kind of have to, do a you know representative sample, but but that's what we're looking for um, when we send things to the plant disease and insect clinic. 
it is challenging to commun communicate that to clients, um, but do your best. And there's some good videos on the clinic website um, and some good instructions that you can share with clients as well. But, you know, the, I guess the bottom line to all that is, you know, when somebody brings in, uh, you know, a, a small stem or a leaf or just part of a plant and is expecting you, you know, you're talking to this client and you're feeling some pressure, um, you know, the answer may be this is an insufficient sample. Um, I mean, you, we, we even get that report a lot from the clinic um, when folks send things in. So that is a perfectly legitimate response is that we can't tell from this sample, but if you do want to pursue it, um, you know, here's what we need. So, um, and then I'm sure Matt Bertrand also mentioned that uh, they do accept digital samples, so pictures at no charge. Um, you know, if they're sending in a physical sample, it costs about 20 bucks for the analysis, um, which is not always worth it. Sometimes it is. Um, you know, if it's a special plant or, you know, you've had the same tomato issue for a number of years or something like that. Um, but uh, you can always do a digital sample. Again, high quality photos are the way to go. Uh, and that's free. And a lot of times you can get a pretty good answer, or at least some insight. And then we want to assess the problem. And I talked about the economic threshold when we're dealing with, uh, you know, an agricultural situation where, you know, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to treat if the cost of a treatment exceeds the value of the loss. Um, and so it's more of a kind of a judgment call in the case of a landscape or garden situation. Something like this that's, you know, key component, focal point of your landscape, maybe that's worth spending a lot of money on, but if it's just an annual flower bed, uh, you know, you can just tear those plants out and replant with something that's, you know, maybe going to do better at, at minimal cost rather than trying to spend the time diagnosing and treating. Um, and, you know, in, in this particular case, uh, a threshold of one is too many. Um, this is uh, damage from the emerald ash borer, which is that new exotic uh, beetle that's a problem on ash trees. And that's just something that if, if it gets established in the tree, it's kind of a death sentence. Um, not much you can do about it. Um, let's see, I already talked about those. And then we want to select the control measure. And, you know, if we can do hand removal, that's great. And, you know, that's something that we can communicate to uh, clients if, if they see egg masses, getting those egg masses off and being able to identify the egg masses that are associated with particular pests. Uh, if you see uh, the, the bagworms, um, uh, on your Leyland cypress or other plants, uh, you know, picking off those little, those little uh, bags that are hanging down is is very effective and helpful. When we see the, the this leaf gall on azaleas, just clipping those out is very effective. And in fact, you know, the only effective treatment is is clipping those out. Um, sometimes we can exclude pests. In the case of cutworms, we can put a little barrier around the base of the stem. Uh, sometimes in, in garden situations, we can use lightweight row covers to exclude insects. Uh, and then sometimes we'll resort to pesticides. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that when we do use them, we want to use them as a last resort. We want to choose the least effective option, uh, and, and that's very crucial. So, you know, these are a couple of examples. This is um, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, which is a pesticide made out of a bacteria. So it's, you know, natural, naturally derived, very low toxicity, um, you know, uh, 
it's very targeted, so you don't get uh, impacts on a lot of beneficial insects. Um, so that's often a good choice when you're dealing with caterpillars. Um, so why don't I stop there for a moment, Ashley, take a breather. And I noticed we had one question earlier that um, we missed, which was, um, this is actually an interesting one because it's kind of a core question. When you say toxic, um, who do you, what do you mean by that? So is it toxic to the ecosystem, humans, animals, all, or all of the above? Great question. Um, yeah, I think when we use the term, I think when we use the term toxicity with regards to a pesticide, we're specifically talking about human toxicity. Um, but environmental impact is definitely, you know, something that we need to think about. Um, and, I, and I'll share some information here about how you can um, think through that and make sure that you're making good decisions. Awesome. And um, we have one question about that you on the last slide, you were mentioning um, BT, correct? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so I'll put that in the chat for Janet. But um, do you want to take a break now or? Um, are we, or should we? We're going to try to go to 11th. At least I'm going to try to go to about 1130. Is that the plan or 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 sooner? Yeah. Uh, so um, I could go until I could go another 10 minutes or so and then take a break or we can take one now. Sure. And then um, one question real quick. Um, do you differentiate between chemicals and pesticides or are you using those terms? Some interchangeably. Uh, I'm using them interchangeably, I think. Okay, cool. All right. So a couple more minutes and then we'll have maybe a 15 minute break. Okay. That sounds right. good. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll go to, yeah. Why don't I go to five more minutes and then we'll take a, a 15 minute break. Is that what you want to do? Okay. All right. So one of the, as as I said at the beginning, one of the things I want you to go away with is that these products can be safe if they're used correctly and judiciously. Um, and I think part of convincing you of that <laughs> is to explain how these things make it to market. And because it's complicated and it's extensive and there's a whole registration process. It's regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency and to some extent by the local departments of agriculture in your state. Uh, comprehensive multi-step process costs tens of millions of dollars for a company to bring a product to market. And these are all the things that they're looking at. And it's not just like, oh, let's consider these. It's research projects on each of these questions. Does the product work? Is it toxic to humans? Does it have any environmental impacts uh, or effects on the ecology? Um, are there residues on food if it's a product that's used on food? And when I, my three year stint in the um, pesticide industry, this was the big thing that we were looking at was residues on food, primarily with, uh, you know, products that are that were used on a large scale on, on agricultural crops. Um, but, you know, extensive uh, research studies done in the field, multiple sites, various locations around the country, different crops, you know, uh, so, the point is, it's not just somebody in a lab concocting something, throwing it in a bottle and throwing a, a, a pretty label on it and, and putting it on the shelf. Uh, the registration process, it takes many, many years, tens of millions of dollars. 
and the cost has to do with all of those tests. So one of the first things we're looking at is, you know, somebody develops a new chemical and they want to know, does it kill weeds? Does it kill insects? And so they're going to look at that in very controlled laboratory or greenhouse conditions and just assess, is this potential new product or chemistry, does it have any utility? Um, so very controlled environment where it's, you know, we're dealing with, an, you know, we're, we're dealing with a new chemistry here. And so we don't want to take the risk of, you know, spraying it out or exposing people. So it's a very controlled uh, process in a controlled environment. Uh, eventually, you know, they will take it out to the field um, after they've done some initial testing. Not on this scale. This was just a stock photo that I found. It's going to be small plots, <laughs> I assure you, um, when, when we're doing uh, efficacy testing. And then extensive toxicology testing. And we're looking at multiple aspects of toxicology. We're looking at ac acute and chronic effects. So acute is immediate. Chronic would be long-term. Uh, birth defects would affect the reproductive system genetic mutations, cause cancer, harm internal organs, what happens if the product is ingested or absorbed. So there's a whole range of different uh, research um, projects or tests that are done to assess toxicology. And then, you know, if I were there with you, I'd have somebody come up to the front of the room and I'd hand them a, a spray bottle of water and I'd tell them to spray out some water and then ask them to put the, the water that they'd sprayed out back in the bottle. <laughs> and you can't do that. So when we're going to release something into, into the environment, uh, something new, we need to know how it's going to affect the environment. And so part of the registration process is looking at that pretty extensively. So we're looking at, does it get into the groundwater? Um, what happens to that molecule uh, over time? Does it get broken down from sunlight or water? Does it move? Does it stay in place? Um, does, does it affect different kinds of animals? Does it affect the aquatic environment? Uh, certainly more and more emphasis on how things might affect pollinators and other beneficial insects. And then, as I indicated earlier, uh, does the product leave unsafe residues on food? And these are all things that are answered by research projects. So they're studied rigorously. EPA reviews those studies carefully. The other thing about it is that products undergo a re-registration process on a uh, on a cycle. So every few years, the EPA takes a fresh look because science continues to evolve. Um, you know, researchers at universities continue to look at products. And so sometimes we get new information. And so we change, you know, how the label is worded uh, or the crops where it can be used. Um, so uh, again, that's why I think that if used correctly and judiciously, pesticides can be used very safely. Um, and I'll give you some, some specifics, but the bottom line is that that registration process leads to the label. So all that research uh, informs very specifically the specific wording on the product label and the instructions that are on that product. Um, so Ashley, I can stop there and... Uh, for the break. Awesome. And when we get back, I'll go more into what's on that label and what the information is that uh, you need to pay attention to. Awesome. All right, everyone, let's take a break and let's come back at 1030. Does that sound good for folks? Yeah. So really do stretch your legs. You'll need it. <laughs> Thank you. And, and as a reminder for snacks, um, you will actually just give Margaret a pat on the back next week because you'll realize how much you missed her.
Um, and I'm good to hang out here for now. So if anybody has question, comment, rebuttal while we're breaking, <laughs> I'm glad awesome. to hear it. Or talk about the weather or whatever. Uh, oh, I have a question. Sure. Hey, hey Paul, thanks so much. Um, so I had put the I had I put this in the chat and Ashley mentioned it. It was a last question recent. And I asked about well, you answered it. You are using chemicals and pesticides interchangeably, right? Uh I, I probably did. Okay, so I'm not holding <laughs> not holding you to that. But so uh you when you asked that question, I knew it was a trick question because chemicals are in everything, even you know, the best of chemicals. And herbs can have a toxic chemical effect if misused, medicinal herbs and all kinds of things. But I was looking up boric acid because that's how I deal with roaches mm -hmm. better than the traps. And, um, you know, it's all from the earth. All those chemicals are from the earth. And you, I don't know that anyone's died from overconsumption, but you wouldn't, you know, you want to use it respectively. But what are your, your particular thoughts on boric acid as a chemical pesticide? I mean, sometimes when I think of pesticides, I just think something that kills, but that's not necessarily because they can control. Um, and also not just boric acid, but diatomaceous earth. But if you have anything to say about that, it's fine if you don't. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, so it, it, So you can, I mean, you can buy roach control products, uh, particularly bait stations, uh, where the active ingredient is boric acid, and it's 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 a pesticide. I mean, it's registered as a pesticide. It has an EPA registration number. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the um, you know toxicology of boric acid is. Uh, um, so it, I can't respond to that. But I, at, at and and perhaps you have the answer to that. Um, you guys often have in your well in any county. Master gardeners are a group of very smart people um from often from very very interesting backgrounds um uh but i will give you a resource at near the end of the presentation where uh, you can get get more information about um toxicology jack anderson says the um uh lethal dose 50 percent ld50 is 2600 milligrams per kilogram um So I, I'm he's, not, he's saying that for uh, boric acid. I'm assuming he oh, didn't okay. specify. Okay. Um, um, okay. Diatomaceous well, earth. Um, the so you, you can purchase diatomaceous earth that's just marketed not as a pesticide, and then you can decide if you're going to use it that way. Um, uh, there is an inhalation risk with diatomaceous earth. I would not handle diatomaceous earth without wearing a, uh, uh, you know, dust mask respirator. Mm -hmm. Probably an N95. Yeah, there there are of course diatomaceous uh, sources of uh, that are different of di diatomaceous earth used in pool cleaning. Mm -hmm. It's not what one would take or use for personal or animal or whatever use. Very different products. So even mm -hmm. though they're diatomaceous earth, it just, I want to thank you because it helps me to remember and be even more sensitive 
to what I'm using in the yard, even though I said no yeah. to 99% of everything right. you said. And I thought, yeah, but still <laughs> yeah. don't go to sleep about it, you know? Yeah. And, and, and you know, and I would argue, uh, you know, if, if I'm going to use something natural, I'd rather purchase it as something that's been through the EPA registration process if I have a choice, because then I'm getting, uh, you know, safety information, you know, complete safety information and, uh, you know, a good rate recommendation and, you know, reasonable information about uh, how, you know, what kind of pests it's going to control, um, you know, as opposed to, I read it online. I think it's good too, because I mean, I think it brings up kind of the nuance of this conversation, right, which is that um, whether it's an organic source or whether it's kind of a conventional chemically derived source, um, something that's organic can actually be pretty gnarly. Like, right, a lot of times the way they make kind of the vinegar based pesticides work is because they're really strong. They're really strong. That's how they make them work. And it'll it'll yeah. burn on contact like it'll do all these other things as opposed to some of our, you know, kind of conventional chemicals where um they have done everything they can to make it so it doesn't have those impacts. Re remind me, um, Ashley, when we start the class back to, um, if you if you if you think of it, to give Joe Neal's take on natural alternatives to Roundup. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, I, it's just one of those things where I would be, and I also think that it's important to remember, you know, organic versus conventional, and then also that we are all somewhere on this spectrum, right? where all of us are going to use something at some point. Um, and the question just is like, where do you put your, your milepost and recognize that some people are further along and some people are further along in the other direction. And that's all okay, because mm -hmm. we're all kind of just making that choice that works best for us. But um, yeah, just one quick sidebar. Some of you might've heard me talking at the beginning about how I enjoy fiber craft, right? So one of my earliest things was I thought I was going to dye all this wool with, with walnut and indigo. I should have used just some dye out of a packet because when you start adding the chemicals that are needed to make those dyes really stick to the wool, right? The mordants, you learn the meaning of open a window for ventilation, right? Like you think you're going to knock yourself out. And it's because, well, I'm, I'm just using plant parts. This is all easy and great. But the chemically derived dyes they've been able to make them effective where you don't think you're going to kill yourself in your dorm room. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> so. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Jack in the chat <laughs> made the comment, you got to be real hungry for boric acid to die from it. <laughs> <laughs> so good to know, Jack. Ooh. So it'll be, I think it'll be interesting. Um, yeah, this is always kind of a fun conversation too, because then you also get into the nuance of LD50 versus chronic exposure and how do we feel about how people are applying things. But yeah. a lot of personal choices and a lot of following labels. Yeah, yeah. Paul? Yeah. Did you, did you have shoulder surgery? I did. Full uh, total, a reverse or rotator? <laughs> uh, you don't have to answer that if you don't want. I'm just getting ready to have one, so that's why I asked. Anyway, yeah, it was it was pretty extensive. Yeah, it was more than just the rotator cuff. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I hope you heal well. Thank you. I'm making progress. It's slow, but I'm making progress. Another question that I had that was a direct chat, but I think is like an interesting thing to bring up when we talk about the spectrum is also um, the use of things like triclopyr and glyph glyphosate to control um, invasive plants and about how even for folks who are typically not interested in using those chemicals, um, for example, like the UNC Botanical Garden, when they start getting into invasives, 
all bets are off and they really value the habitat and they are more concerned about the habitat disruption from invasives than they are from um, targeted use of uh, herbicides. So you'll find that people's kind of even mile marker will change depending on what they're addressing. Yeah, Jack Jack says kill it with fire, um, which, which is often an effective tool, but not always. Um, sometimes with fire, things will survive and sprout back from the roots, whereas with triclopyr and glyphosate, advantages getting, um, you know, killing the root system. That's um, the plant version of killing up fire. Yeah, which can give you better control. So. But but fire is still an effective technique in many situations. So it's a it's a valid point. If you guys ever want to talk about flame weeders, um, it's a really fun conversation. All right, I have 10.30. All Um, oh, let's see. Stand by for a second. All right, so I got it. Are you seeing need to see? Yep. Okay. Um, so that registration process leads to the label. And you know, if you choose not to follow the instructions when you're you know assembling furniture, um I don't know that I'd recommend that for a tall bookcase, but you know, for an end table or something like that, if you want to just burn the instructions and then put it together, you know, with no guidance, that's a personal call. But in the case of pesticides, I think it's really, really important to read the instructions, uh, regardless of what you're using. Um, and the instructions, can be confusing and the print is small. There's a lot of information on there, uh, but if you'll start developing a habit of it, it'll become a little bit easier for you and it'll become easier to find the information that is important and kind of skim over the stuff that's kind of standard um, verbiage or whatever. But I, I do think it's important. And it's also the law that if you're using a product, you have to follow the instructions. And you can actually be fined and held liable. And, and, you know, granted, you know, the situations where uh, a homeowner is going to be fined for, you know, using, uh, you know, nutsedge control in the wrong location, that's pretty unlikely. Um, but I, I did uh, have a situation where one time where uh, someone had used, uh, I, I think the situation was someone had applied seven dust to uh, flowers that were blooming. And then as there was a, a beekeeper in the neighborhood and the bees were visiting those blooming flowers and collected seven dust along with the pollen and took it back to the hive and it killed off the hive. Uh, and that beekeeper could have a claim against you for misapplication of the seven dust. So um, it's not something to, to take lightly. But what's on the label? 
um, it, it's it's mandated by law what's going to be on there, and we'll go over these these things, and then I'm going to give you a chance, as you know, to practice finding information. So when we look at a a, a label, uh, you know, here's Ortho Ground Clear, just random product I saw on the shelf, and if we look up close, we can see the active ingredients. So we've always got the brand name. Uh, but then we've got the common name of the active ingredients. And, and that's this chemical sounding name that we see on the label. So when we're talking about uh, typical Roundup, it's a little bit nuanced, but when we talk about typical Roundup, the uh, active ingredient is glyphosate. Uh, now, in this particular product, we've got not only glyphosate, we've got imazepir. So this particular product is not the same as just using straight glyphosate. glyphosate. Um, but this this is dated information, but it's 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 helpful. Um, uh, Charlotte Glenn, who I mentioned earlier, uh, NC State Extension Master Gardener Coordinator, back when she was an agent, uh, she and her Master Gardener volunteers in I think New Hanover County or Pender County, I forget where she was. They went to all the places in the county that sold products, and they found that there were 110 different brands of insecticides, but there were only 23 different active ingredients, and similar type of scenario with fungicides and herbicides. So that means that just because you're seeing two different brand names doesn't mean that um, they have different active ingredients. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can save money by choosing the, the one that has the same active ingredient that's lower cost, but not always. Um, there's also on the label a signal word, and this gives you a kind of ballpark uh, indication of how toxic, we talked about toxicology, how toxic that product is. Um, so if you see a pesticide, and the signal word is danger, and it's always going to be on the front of the package. Um, an adult can be killed by a taste to a teaspoon. And so when we're selecting products for the lawn and garden, we want to try to stay in this caution category as much as possible. And so if, you, if you've got a choice between two products and one of them has a danger signal word and the other one has a caution, I would choose the caution, even if the caution one maybe didn't work quite as well. Now, one thing that you'll find, at least in the home garden market, is there's not a lot of products that are going to have a danger uh, signal word. Um, most products that are sold to home gardeners will have a caution label, maybe a few with a warning. And it's, it's, I think it's pretty uncommon to find things with a danger signal word, but just something to be aware of. Um, you also see information on that label about how to protect your family. That's a question that you know I get from time to time as an extension agent. Um, I, I need to control this pest, but I, I I don't want you know I've got children or grandchildren that play in the yard, and I want to make sure that I don't you know harm them. Well, the precautions that you need to follow are on the label. Protecting your pets, it's on the label. Uh, how to protect the environment. Again, it's on the label. Uh, if you follow those instructions, you're, you're doing what you need to do. Um, there's products that if they get into a creek or a pond, they're going to hurt, uh, you know, tadpoles and minnows and things like that. So if, if that's the case with a product you're using, it'll say don't apply to water or don't apply within so many feet of water or something like that. Uh, how to protect bees. Um, uh, that's going to be on there as well with all the concern. There's also going to be information about physical and chemical hazard, if it's caustic, if it's uh, an explosive hazard, uh, what you might need to do for first aid, if you get it on your skin, if you get it in your eyes, you know, do you need to 
just rinse it off with water or do you need to flush your eyes for 30 minutes or do you need to rush to the <laughs> to the doctor again you know most of the products that are sold to homeowners um are going to have relatively low risk um so uh, storage information um one of the things I, I, I do sometimes for Master Gardener classes, um, after this class, uh, I assign a homework assignment of uh, go, go home and do an inventory of all the pesticide products that you have in your home. And not only what you have, but where they are stored. Um, and are they stored correctly? And this is a case, a staged case, I want to emphasize. <laughs> of a pesticide that is stored incorrectly because it is under the sink where a child can get to it. Uh, all pesticides are gonna have the statement somewhere on the label in the front, usually keep out of the reach of children. So, you know, in this case, that was not observed. Uh, it'll have disposal information about what to do with the empty containers, what to do with leftover product, what to do with excess spray solution. In general, uh, when containers are empty, uh, again, for homeowner products, they can just go in your, into your household trash, assuming they are empty. Uh, leftover product does need to generally go to household hazardous waste. And excess spray solution, uh, it's best to avoid that. So mix what you need for that application if you are mixing. Uh, and use it up. And if you do have excess spray solution, uh, it needs to be used um, uh, on a labeled site. So if it's a weed killer for turf, it needs to be sprayed out on a turf location. Um, our pesticide container disposal sites don't look like that, by the way, uh, in North Carolina. I am pleased to say. I need to change that picture. Directions for use are going to be on the label. And this is really relevant from a, an economic standpoint and, and you not wasting your money. Uh, what pests are controlled? Um, so is it going to be effective against nut sedge or crabgrass or uh, common Bermuda grass or what exactly? Um, and also where it can be used. And this is vitally important if you go back to uh, the slide where we had uh, multiple different brand names that Charlotte and her master gardeners found, but uh, only a handful of active ingredients. They are not necessarily interchangeable because it could be that some of those are formulated for use on a turf grass situation and another product with the same active ingredient uh, might be labeled for the vegetable garden and they are not interchangeable. And it would be um, uh, very inadvisable to try to interchange them. Uh, directions for use, the application method and the rate. Um, so this is an instance where um, the homeowner had made a uh, weed killer application to their lawn. And then because of failure of communication between the homeowner and their lawn service, the lawn service came in the, the next day and made a weed killer application. And they the, the, the labeled rate was exceeded and so there was damage to the turf. So it's really important that we follow that uh, method and rate for, for application for applying that product. Um, Another important piece of information is the re-entry interval, uh, which is going to be how long to stay out of the treated area. Uh, and that's usually the answer to how do I protect my children and my pets is you look for that re-entry information. And in most in the case of most homeowner products, it will be uh, keep people and pets out of the treated area until the spray dries. And that on a hot summer day, that could be a matter of 30 minutes or less. And, and that's when it's considered safe to re-enter. In the case of products that are used on food crops, 
uh, you will need to look for the pre-harvest interval, which is uh, how long between that application and when you should be harvesting that crop. And that has to do with making sure that you don't have unsafe residues of that product on, on the harvested portion of the crop. In some cases, like in the case of an insecticidal soap on a tomato, the harvest interval is probably zero days, which means that you could spray uh, for your aphids or whatever, or white flies on your tomatoes and harvest that same day. In other cases, it might be two days or five days or 30 days, uh, but you need to know that. Um, well, also, um, so that's that's what's on the label. Um, let's see, okay. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll point out, actually, let me come back to that. And let's go to the, would this be a good time to go to the label reading exercise, Ashley? So let's do yeah. that. Um, so basically, um, Ashley sent you a pesticide label. Um, Bioadvanced tree and shrub insect killer. And I want you guys to practice, get a little bit of practice reading the label. And uh, there's 10 questions we're going to have you answer. Um, and Ashley, you can, Ashley has just posted those questions in the chat. Are you ready for, are you ready for breakout rooms, you guys? Ooh. It's going to get real. Um, so, Paul, like 10 to 15 minutes, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to put you in breakout rooms, and we want you to kind of have that label in front of you uh, and work through the, the 10 questions that Ashley put in the chat. And uh, Ashley and I will kind of be rotating through the different breakout rooms um, in case there's questions or whatever. Um, see how folks are progressing, and we'll give you 10 minutes or so to do that. Sounds good. How many people per breakout room, Ashley? You're going to have four to five people per room. Okay. Okay. And that's okay, everyone... be kind of an, if you've never done that before, it's kind of an automatic process. Shall we? Let's. This is where we secretly find out who got up to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, okay, so we um, can you do you have a little box that shows you how to join rooms? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll, um, I guess I'll start from 10 and work back if you want to work forward from one. Okay. Or however, I don't know. It'll be fine. Okay. Yeah, Whatever so happens. are there, there's 10 breakout, nine. Oh, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, there's nine. Hmm. All right. So I'll do, I'll do one through four. Sure. And, and do... I think, yeah, that sounds great. I'll do five through nine. Okay, cool. See you in all of it. Okay. Hello. Hello. I was trying to find our questions from our breakout room, so that's why I came back. Okay, I got kicked out, and okay, I'm back. Maybe I won't be able to go back. So let me see if I can go back now myself. Same. Oh, I can't. I can't either. One of these, I was able. Oh, there it is join break room on on my screen on the top left it says join break room maybe you can click on
Okay. I can see the document, but not the questions. That's the problem we were having. Couldn't see the questions in the chat. <laughs> so I'll go back.
Hi, everyone. So hopefully I eventually found all of you and gave you all what you needed. <laughs> best laid plans, best laid plans of Zoom. That's how it goes. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, Ashley, what's the best way to do this? Um, we can just work through them. And if folks want to um, put things in the chat, that would be great. Or if they want to holler out, that would be great. But I think whatever we do is fine. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to, how am I going to do this? Um, if I'm moving slow, it's because I have to do everything one handed. Okay, I'm going to share the label. Is that what everybody's seeing now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay, so there's the label. We'll start at the top. And um, all right, so Ashley, what's the first question? First question is, what is the common name of the product? And let me just comment that I didn't explain very well. There's always three names for any particular thing. There's the, the brand name, which in this case is BioAdvanced Tree and Shrub Insect Control Concentrate. And then there's the common name, and then there's a chemical name. Now, on this label, you get that brand name and the common name, you don't see the chemical name. So in the case of like aspirin, for example, example, it would be bear brand name, aspirin common name, and then salicylic acid or whatever is the, as the chemical name. Um, so what's the chemical name or the common name rather for this product? Somebody shout out or put it in the chat. He said tree and shrub insect control concentrate, but um, sounds like that is the brand name, not the common name. We have a vote for imidacloprid in the um, chat. And Jack is correct. Imidacloprid is the common name. So it's, it's possible that you would see more than one product that had the same active ingredient. So take your reading glasses to the store with you um, in case you want to do some comparison shopping. All right, so the next chemical question. name and the brand name are the same? I mean, the chemical name and common name are the same? Uh, no, the chemical name is going to be some long chemistry sounding with oxy, diethyl, cetic, you know, <laughs> I'm making that up in case you didn't know. Um, okay, so it's not the the active ingredient. Okay. Next question. Signal word. That's an easy one. Caution. Caution, Caution is in fact the signal word. And by the way, Jack found the chemical name presumably through through Google. Um, Chemical name for imidacloprid is N16 chloro 3 iridyl methyl, et cetera. That's what we call an exercise for the reader. <laughs> Good job, Jack. All right, caution is in fact the signal word, which is the, the lowest of the three toxicity categories. So that's good to know. Yeah, Jack knew that off the top of his head. Yeah. I'm certain of that. Next question. Can I use this to control white flies on tomatoes? No. Why not? You cannot use it on food source, food types. Well done. Yeah. So that's where we got to remember products are not interchangeable because you see white fly on the label. You go to the store with white flies on your tomato and you see this, you know, white, white fly and big, you know, big print on the front. But, but no, you cannot use it on, on any food products, any food crops. All right, 
Landscape formula, that's right. Uh, next question. How much should I apply to protect an ash tree with a trunk circumference of 12 inches from the emerald ash borer? Who wants to tackle that one? Mm -hmm. Jack, Jack says six ounces. Jack, you want to explain uh, auditorially how you calculated that, where you found it? Um, how much to use right there? One half ounce per inch of distance around trunk. Okay. So some simple math. And you get times 0.5. Perfect. All right. Next question. Uh, true or false? I should wear chemical resistant gloves when using this product. Bo says true. Anybody disagree? It didn't say it. Well, let's see. Where did we see that? It's not on that page. Let me pull it up. We, page we six had a lot of information, um, and I think it was on page six for that. It says harmful to humans. <clears throat> hey, can you? Yeah. Page six. Let me scroll down to page six. Wow. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and under the caution, avoid contact with skin, eyes, or clothing. Okay. Just don't pour it on your hands. We didn't see that. Yeah. It's not how PPE works. Okay, so <laughs> uh, you could argue this either way, and I could have phrased the question differently. I could have said, does the label require you to wear gloves when using this product? Um, which then makes it actually a legal requirement. Uh, but I didn't say that. I said, should you? So... I, mm. I, I don't see anywhere on the label where it requires you to use gloves. And in fact, labels will be very specific about if there is a need to wear gloves or wear a dust mask or, or eye protection or whatever. They will be very specific about that. And this does not mention that. But should you? Probably a good idea. I probably would. Um, Okay, next question. Oh, is this product ready to use or a concentrate? Concentrate. 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 Yep. Is it right on the front? Page. Yeah, page, first page. Yep, right there. It is in concentrate, which means you, you will need to mix it with water um, before you apply it. It does need to be diluted. Um, and I will make an argument that where you have the option, there's a big advantage to using um, ready to use uh, products, ready to use formulations where, where they're available, uh, pre-diluted. Um, so we'll get to that shortly. All right, next. What is the REI restricted entry interval? After it it's has dry. Gone. Okay. Um, it was interesting. It said children and pets when it's dry. So but where where did you where did you find uh, that? I think that's on page, page three. Yeah. Is that yeah. three or six? Six. It's probably. page three. Oh. Page three. Okay, so let's look on page three. <laughs> mm. Okay, there is this this statement here on page three that says. Children and pets may re-enter the treated area after it has dried, after the treated area has dried. Um, so, and then somebody said they saw something on page six. No, maybe that was the same one. I think it's that. that yeah. One. Okay. Yeah, so it, there's not anything, and I mentioned this to some of the groups, there's not anything on the label that says the restricted entry interval is X number of hours or days so you just kind of have to know what you're looking for. All right, will next it question. Always, will, it, will it always have that, um, that sign, this sort of um, graphic? Little okay. icon with yes, the- Yes, with the children and pets in it, and then a, a slash. I, I will say I have seen that uh, 
uh, a number of times. I, I don't know if it's if it's an always or just common. And I saw that Stephanie had raised her hand. So is there a difference between restricted reentry and reentry? Is that what you're saying there? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Reentry interval is the same as restricted entry interval. Those those are the same thing. So forgive me if I've used those terms. Uh, I should have been more consistent. No, that's fine. I just wanted to, um, you know, be be um, clear. So then, what we're looking at right here doesn't really fall under the category of. Uh, restricted interval. Say it again. Restricted. Uh, let's interval. let's let's just use the term reentry interval. Got I it. think that's okay, a little. Thanks. I think that's a little easy to easier to understand, and and I should have been consistent about that. Thank you. That's fine. Thank. You. Yeah. Great question. Thanks for catching me on that. All right. Next question, Ashley. What is the uh, PHI pre-harvest interval? Don't harvest. You don't harvest. Yeah, this is a product that's not allowed, as we've indicated, to be used on food. So therefore, <clears throat> uh, harvest interval does not apply. All right, next, Ashley. Would you classify this product as persistent? We said yes. Yes. And uh, Terry, how, why did you say yes? Because it says that that is good for 12 month protection. Yep. So it was stable. Yep, great. Yeah. I have a question with the persistent, is that in the, the plant itself or is that talking about the soil mobility? Like we don't know whether it stays in the soil after it doesn't help the tree. Uh, it, uh, uh, we know it's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, it, it could be one or the other or both potentially. So we'd have to read a little further. The label further doesn't tell us that, right? Um, it may have some verbiage about that at the end where it talks about environmental things. So let's come back to that. Actually, what's next? And I will say that um, Jack shared something there where it's really helpful um, if you have questions about that kind of stuff, just to straight up start researching it yourself as well. You know what I mean? Like it is always a good idea when you have questions about pesticides too. <laughs> when so if a, if a uh, homeowner asks, then we should say you need to look it up. Or we can look it up, you know, or I mean, however it is, you know, if you're there doing office and you have some time to answer, that's a good time to look it up with them because okay. it's also good to go through the exercise of showing people how to find things. But okay, yeah. sorry. Do you and think I'll, this, oh, sorry. And I'll share a good resource on that too. Nice. Do you think this product poses any risk to pollinators? If so, how? It does if you yeah. apply it incorrectly. Yes. So where did you, how did you determine that, Jack? Uh, it's on page six. And it does say that it's toxic to bees. It's toxic, no matter how it's applied. <laughs> really toxic. So if we look under environmental hazards, uh, that you go, you're in bullet, Spanish now. Sorry, thank you. It's two columns, English and Spanish. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, on the left-hand side, it's, it's English. Um, so this fourth bullet point, the product is highly toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment or residues on blooming plants or weeds. Wow. Not applied to blooming plants or weeds. Bees, bees are foraging in the treatment area. Good find. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the things that I will say um, kind of bottom line is that you know, I started out saying pesticides are, you know, valuable tools if used correctly and sparingly and judiciously. And this is a product that because of that pollinator risk, because of that persistence, it should be used very sparingly. But 
one of the uh, things that this product does is it controls emerald ash borer, which if you remember I said is an invasive insect um, and is a death sentence for an ash tree if it gets in there. So if you have a highly prized ash tree in your landscape, this is a product that you'd probably want to use um, just as a matter of protecting it. So if the ash tree was kind of like in the center, but then you had a bunch of flowering plants around it, how would you go about doing that and protecting bees? Great question. So um, it says, do not apply the product to blooming plants or weeds if bees are foraging in the treatment area. So I think it would be a matter of timing and, and location of, of where you were pouring the product. Or can you do it during a certain time of year when things aren't blooming or whatever? That would be another strategy you could use for sure. But it's uh, but it's persistent, and you know, and Bo was asking the question about you know, uh, do 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 bees uh, forage in uh, when when the ash is blooming, and and I guess that was kind of my question. So let's say you use it properly, you're only applying it to the ash tree but it's persistent for 12 months. Is this chemical being passed through into the nectar and the pollen and the bees are harvesting it that way? Um, I think that, that's a question that's beyond my expertise. Um, I think- ah, uh, Bo, Bo answered at least one part of the question there. So. I, I think um, uh, Steve, Dr. Steve Frank, an entomologist at NC State, um, and, and other folks have, have done some work on that, and I haven't looked recently at, at, at their findings, but uh, that is a concern. So again, sparingly, judiciously um, for this particular product. And I think it's really important, too, to think about then what is the value of that particular ash in the landscape, right? If it's a standout, spectacular specimen tree, great. If it's one in a forest and you don't, it's it's not that specimen, you know, that's about doing that kind of balance for yourself because mm -hmm. even if these pollinators are not actively foraging um, or collecting nectar from those trees, right? If that's gone persistent, it is going to impact other insects that are feeding on leaves, any of that kind of stuff, right? Like it doesn't, if it, if it impacts a white fly or something like that, you know, it could probably impact closely related species. So it's just worth thinking about like where your balance is. So this is a great discussion and I'm about out of time, but let me just make a few um, final points um, in conclusion here. And then I know there's one question that we haven't answered and we'll have maybe time for another question or two. Um, but uh, just as far as, you know, being safe, uh, applying them correctly, uh, following the instructions is, is crucial. Um, where products do uh, indicate that it's good to wear gloves or, or that you should wear gloves or even if it and you died to it's it's probably just a good practice to get into um some thought about selecting those gloves because really gloves are one of the most important things you can do to protect yourself from exposure again emphasizing most of the products from the homeowner market are low toxicity but you know you know when we talk about the risk of using pesticides and health impacts. Uh, I think the potential for health impacts in homeowners is very, very small. Um, where we really get concerned is farmers and farm workers uh, and you know professional applicators that are using them on a more regular basis and potentially using, um, you know, 
more toxic products and, and those ty types of things. Um, but we wanna make sure if we're selecting gloves, we're getting heavy duty gloves, chemical resistant, uh, nitrile or neoprene is a recommended material to look for. You don't wanna use leather gloves. And you know, one of my favorite kinds of gloves just for general yard work is the cloth material that's been dipped in like rubber or latex. Uh, those are not satisfactory for um, making pesticide applications because the back of the glove being cloth, uh, the whatever material you're using can soak through. Um, definitely want to avoid leather and you don't want a glove with any type of cloth lining. Um, I often find, uh, you know, I, if I'm looking for gloves, if you don't see any in the garden section, you might look in the in the uh, the paint section. Sometimes you'll see, uh, you know, gloves that people use for stripping paint and things like that. And those are generally or are often uh, satisfactory as well. I do like the ones that come up and cover the forearm a little bit. Um, if you are gonna use uh, disposable gloves, then they're disposable. So take them off and throw them away when you're done. If you're using reusable gloves, it's a good idea to, before you take them off, wash them, at least with running water um, and maybe even with a little bit of soap. Um, so just, you know, turn on the garden hose and, you know, pretend like you're washing your hands, uh, but washing the gloves before you take them off. So that's all about gloves. Um, storage uh, locked out of reach of children is ideal. Um, you know, pay a little bit of attention to storage conditions, but, uh, you know, as far as temperature and such, but um, if you can storing them in, you know, in a garage or an outdoor shed, as opposed to in the laundry room or something like that is certainly preferable. And never, never put of pesticide into a drink container or any other type of container other than the container in which it was sold, um, unless there's a leak. In, in that case, you may need to take some action, but um, there are uh, way too many cases where, oh, let me share this little bit of this product with, with my neighbor or my friend or my fellow farmer. And, uh, and then somebody ends up ingesting it because they mistake it for uh, a beverage or whatever. And uh, sometimes, you know, people have had serious illnesses or died from that. So um, I'm going to skip over this stuff because it's pretty common sense. Um, if you are making pesticide recommendations, make sure you're using extension reference you know, provide various options if there are, but you can certainly emphasize the low toxicity options um, and remind them to read the label. And here's the bottom line, my top 11 tips. Use as a last resort, choose the least toxic product, buy only what you need. And I, I mentioned the, the ready to use formulations as opposed to the concentrates. The advantage of the ready to use formulations is that you don't have to mix them. And the mixing, when you're dealing with the concentrate, that's when you're dealing with the, with the product in its highest toxicity form. Uh, you know, if you spill the concentrate on your skin, it's, it's a whole lot more concentrated uh, to state the obvious versus getting a little bit of spray solution or a dil diluted solution. So if you're using a ready to use product, there's no mixing. Um, it may be already diluted. So it's just a much safer, safer product to use. Where uh, PPE is an abbreviation for personal protective equipment, whether that's gloves, long sleeves, long plant pants, certainly you want to wear closed toed shoes for the most part. Um, just common sense. Um, if you're using, if you are using a concentrated product, use extra care when you're mixing. Mix what you need for the application so that you don't have excess spray solution. 
You don't want to leave excess spray solution in a sprayer that you forget what it is or it freezes over the winter and destroys your sprayer and then you've got a big mess. Avoid drift, um, avoid your entry intervals and your, your harvest intervals, store safely and dispose of properly. Um, so I will stop there. Because I told Ashley I would go till 1130. And that's where we're at. So we do have one question on, um, So, well, two questions. One, and this is one I know that a lot of folks are kind of dealing with. Um, if my neighbor is randomly spraying their yard for insects, how will I know uh, if the drift will or will not impact whatever I'm growing in my yard? So this might be especially relevant for some of the mosquito control companies. Mm. Yeah. Um, next question. <laughs> I guess um, so, what, so what, one way, second, one way, second, I, Paul, one, one, I'm sorry. Yeah, one, Hello, let me, can you hear me? Let me, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, yeah, let me make yeah. a comment. Um, so, so obviously, what are the wind conditions during the application? And if, if it's not a real windy day, then, then, you know, if the wind is three or four miles an hour, then you're probably safe. Also, just observation, if, if you're able to observe the application. Um, you know, I, I don't know. There's a lot you can do beyond that. If an application is being made by a pest control company, um, you know, I think it would be reasonable to ask them what product they're using. And then you could look up the label and read the label and see, um, you know, or does it seem like they're doing it according to the label instructions? Um Monica, so, did you want to provide extra? Yeah, um, it's that, yeah, well, right. That's what, it, since we do have these labels and the companies are required to provide all this information for these chemicals, if I see the guy pull up to my neighbor's yard, if I can go to the driver of the truck and say, hey, I want to see the label of what you're spraying out here, will they have that in the truck? Or do I have to contact the company and blah, blah, blah? They, they, they are required they should have the label with them. Um, now, they are not necessarily obligated to provide it to you, but I think if you approach them in a friendly, neighborly manner, uh, you know, they could at least tell you um, if they didn't, you know, per, you know, hand you the label, they could, you know, if I were an applicator and somebody approached me in a very friendly manner and asked me what product I was using, I'd be glad to tell them. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, very good question. Yeah, it's always a big concern, I think, for, for a lot of our folks. Um, so this is kind of a, two questions that are getting at a similar thing, which is, do you have any general advice on shelf life of chemicals? And if you leave it in the garage and it freezes, is it still effective? Um, the label should give you some general parameters as far as storage conditions. Um, you know, some of them will say, do not allow to, you know, to freeze. Uh, I, I think it's wise to purchase what you're going to use in a single season, if possible. Um, so that you don't have to deal with that. And that's another advantage of the ready to use formulations. They're more expensive per application, but it saves you that hassle of ending up with a product that froze or separated, or um, you forgot uh, that you had and rediscovered it five years later. Uh, and now you got to take it to household hazardous waste. Um, Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Paul. This has been really, really awesome. It's always good to have exercise working through. How do we actually read these things? Yeah. Um, and like oh, I mentioned, oh, sorry, go ahead. The resource is, and I'll put the link in the chat, is the National Pesticide Information Center. And it has uh, fact sheets on different uh, active ingredients that will answer some of these questions about what are the risks of these products? Um, 
and and it explains them in uh, you know plain language. So I'll I'll throw that link in the chat. Awesome, thank you so much. And I mentioned this to some folks, but um, never ever ever be shy about opening up one of those labels in the store, right? Like there, it's always a little sticky thing on the back. You can just open it; it's fine. Mm -hmm. That's literally what it's there for. Okay. Yep. Maybe not try to turn out to like rip it terribly so you can close it back up, but it's always good to, to just open it. Um, don't be shy. Don't be shy about that at all. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So thanks, Paula. You can uh, hang out if you want to learn about how to volunteer in Durham County. Um, <laughs> or if you want to get on with the rest of your day, we totally get that too. Um, thank you so much again. Thank you. I'll put a couple of comments in the chat and then I'll log off. Thanks, guys. I enjoyed being with you. Great discussion. Thank you. Congratulations on becoming a Master Gardener volunteer. Thank you. We are the best. Thanks. Um, okay. All right. So we're going to cover um, a little bit about getting started with volunteering, which is super exciting, you guys. Um, it is that time when we feel like we have probably at least eased you into this enough that we can start talking about what the next phase will look like and thinking about how to um, start planning some of your volunteer work. So one thing I wanted to bring up at the beginning was that we actually do have a master gardener listserv that you guys are not on yet, right? And it's because we didn't want to freak everyone out, basically. So we'll be adding you to the listserv this week. Um, it's not a particularly active listserv. You know, you might get one or two emails a week in a typical week, sometimes more, sometimes less. And that'll be things like upcoming volunteer opportunities, field trips, education opportunities, all that kind of stuff. Um, we do moderate that listserv so that we can keep it pretty on topic. Um, and, you know, <laughs> some people love a really, really active listserv. A lot of us do not love a really, really active listserv because it can kind of just, you know, gum up the inbox. So we do moderate that, which also means that if you ever try to post to the listserv, sometimes there's just a short delay um, because myself and another volunteer approve everything. So that's how that works. Um, what we're going to talk about a little bit today is um, how you can get started volunteering um, in the office. Panel will talk about that. And then um, Lee Tree will share about our social media efforts, and I will share about our blog. And these are all kind of places that you can plug into for volunteering. Um, for social media and the blog, these are really, really, really great opportunities, especially um, if you are interested in writing or taking pictures or um, especially if you have a schedule that does not permit you to volunteer kind of during work hours, these are awesome ways to get a lot of hours kind of on your own time, on your own, doing your own thing, which is really convenient for a lot of people. And I will say that the blog and social media together have been um, some of our largest outreach efforts in the past years. Um, and we kind of expect that to continue. So those are really active, really vibrant ways to volunteer, which is fun. So, but first I will let Panna talk about getting started with the office. Well, hello. Hello. Oh, we just Let got me... something. Okay, there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I put my paper over my You're script. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Tina Falker is the, the Master Gardener office manager. I'm here all the time. <laughs> but I, uh, she does the, manage, the office managing for the Master Gardener. Uh, so the training will begin uh, in more early March. Um, and how do you sign up? You sign up online through the intranet. Uh, look for office training. And uh, each, each session that she's doing has a room for three people. Um, preferably two people would be good. Uh, currently, we have sessions available in, in March. We'll be adding future sessions to the calendar soon. Um, season sessions, sorry, sorry, sessions will be 90 minutes. Uh, training will not last the entire shift. However, if you want to stay for the entire shift, Tina will be here uh, for the entire shift if you wish to stay. Um, and the transfers that have transferred in from another county or another state or something is pared down just a little bit. That training is pared down a little bit. Um, there is an end date. We're trying to complete all the trainings by the end of July. So please get on it. <laughs> um, and what can you expect from the, the training sessions? Uh, this training is an overview. It's not intended to teach you everything that you will need to know about the office. This session is meant to be started, be a starting point 
for you to build on. And just so you know, it's based sometimes on the questions that come in. <laughs> that's, that's how you're going to know. It will help uh, you to um, volunteer in the office under a stress-free zone. <laughs> so if you don't know it, you can always say, I don't know that uh, the answer to that. Let me get back to you. Um, and um, <clears throat> you don't have to retain everything. There's a book. <laughs> so, and it, um, I, I really like people to volunteer in the office. <laughs> Just understand that that's my preference um but uh it's just a basic understanding on how the office works um and it's it answers you get all kinds of questions <laughs> all kinds of questions um so the training um is a prerequisite to you doing an office shift and after the after the training office um the interns can volunteer with supervision I personally like them to have supervision for about a year before they're off on their own or to see how you're doing the first few times and we can see how you would do on your own. Um, so there are several, could, several ways you could do it. Be in person any day with a certified master gardener. This is the preferred option for me. <laughs> with another intern in person on days that I'm in the office. And just so you know, I work usually from home on most Fridays. And you can do solo in person with me in the office. Okay. Uh, students who want to volunteer before initial training ends must work in person with a certified master gardener. Um, as a general rule, we don't want interns to work from home until they have enough practice. <laughs> and uh, also a good, good thing is for, before you send off the answer is to send it to me, especially if you're working from home, send it to me and see if it works because I make sure that it's research-based. It has to be research-based. <laughs> and I will hammer that. <laughs> um, uh, we would like all of the interns to complete the training and at least do one shift in the office and see if you like it. <laughs> it's a, um, I always say, if you do one shift in the office once a month, you will have all of your hours, all of your volunteer hours. And then the other things that you do could be played. <laughs> but the office is fun too. Uh, do you have any questions? Hannah, I, I just wanted uh, to make sure everyone understood uh, that the training, uh, it, the training is in person, correct? The training is, is in person and it's with Tina Falker. Correct. Okay, thanks. You said that the uh, sometimes for the trainings will be through March. Um, will those be emailed out or on the intranet or um, they in will, the office? Yeah, they will begin in March, but they will be on the intranet. If you need something more specific, you might want to email or call Tina Falker and see if you can arrange something. Okay, so on the um, the scheduled calendar. Yeah, yeah. The scheduled calendar for the office work. Yeah, and I'll send a list of when those first ones are, so you can kind of see like what the format looks like. But then we'll just be scheduling them basically through the end, and, and you'll be able to find them. But I know it's nice sometimes to to see what it looks like at first, right? <laughs> And right. So the scheduling it. will be added in April, May, June, and July as well. They just right. haven't been yet, just so everyone's aware of that. And just so you know, Tina really keeps track of who has done the training. If you feel like you need to do a refresher course, she also does that. Um, but she keeps track of it so she knows kind of where she's at. And if you're the last one on her list, she may, may nag you. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Typically, Panna, how long is a shift? A shift is three and a half hours. Okay. A shift, the training is only 90 minutes, about 90 minutes. And Tina is very thorough. And there are several master gardeners who you could pair up with. Yesterday, we had uh, 
uh, we had, well, somebody signed up and uh, somebody thought she had signed up. So they both worked together and it was really great. They kind of bounced the ideas off each other and going, is this the one we want to use? Is this, does this answer their questions? And it's just a really good thing to work with somebody. Thank you. Awesome. So we'll share more information about that um, kind of as it all gets going, but just know that we do like it if, and by like it, that's my um, Midwestern way of saying that's basically required. Um, <laughs> you know, there's always exceptions, but please really do try to prioritize that work if you can. Um, the office is really great because you can do it in person or um, once uh, you have a little bit of experience under your belt, you can also do it from home, which is nice. So, but a little bit of experience under your belt helps before you get there. So with that, I will um, let Lolitri talk about social media if she's ready for that. Hey. Good morning or almost good good day. <laughs> good day. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, I'm Lolitri Darniel. Um, I took over the uh, chair chairship of the social media committee this year. And there's a couple other members on the committee. Um, the, with, I think of the social media committee as like an extension of the Master Gardener mission of bringing research-based information to the people, um, especially since like these days, everyone's looking for answers online and Google just gives you like random things, you know, AI generated stuff. Um, it may be written for a different zone completely. Um, Maybe just like clickbait that's just written for clicks, you know, not really true even um, definitely not like research based and you know fact checked so um i think of our efforts as like a way to really get that research based information out there in front of people's eyes you know whether they like it or not um so uh we share lots of different stuff um information about events is a great thing that i like to do um so we have a, cl a class coming up or a plant sale um we support the blog by posting their content, cross-posting it. Um, and we come up with our own stuff, usually like a short article type thing, um, usually with a, well, almost always with a photo to catch people's eye. Um, I like to like, just think of an idea that's something timely, uh, go on NCSU and kind of click around, do some searches and then, you know, write like a short article and then post that. Um, it's like Ashley said, it's a great way to volunteer on your own time. and you can really rack up the time. Like if you're doing a research-based thing, you know, an, a post can be 45 minutes of like work, making a graphic, writing it up, scheduling it, everything like that. Um, so do you want me to share my screen and talk about what it looks That'd be like? cool. Okay, uh, let's see. I've actually never done this before. So there's a big green button. Safari. Okay. So Okay, so this is our Facebook page. Probably most of you know what a Facebook page looks like, but um, we try to post at least like three to four times a week um, in the morning-ish. We've been we're experimenting with like whether evening gets more engagement. Um, I'm not sure that matters. Um, so this is just kind of what we've posted in the past week. Um, here's a blog cross-posting. Everything has a photo. Um, things often have links. Um, here's our Instagram page. It's basically the same things, but we think that maybe the crossover of subscribers to our Facebook and Instagram are not a circle, like it's some kind of Venn diagram. Um, but so we, we pretty much put the same stuff on both. Um, Instagram does have some shares from other places that don't go on Facebook. Um, and sort of behind the curtain um, is the meta business suite, which lets us post to both pages. And this is what that looks like. Um, it tells us we have, if I can move this in there. Um, let's see, look on this, our reach. We, I mean, Facebook is trying to like get us to you know by ads. So it's gonna sort of tell us that our reach is this or that. Um, but um, we have 1.8 thousand Facebook followers, there we go, and 1,500 Instagram followers, um, which is pretty great. Um, 
and we use this little planner to schedule posts so you don't have to like be in front of your computer at 10 o'clock you can schedule a post to go out whenever you want it to so this is this week we had pretty much one every day um so yeah so short posts researched from ncsu and other um extension sites always with a big nice picture sometimes i'll make a graphic um i can make this graphic about um February being for pruning. I don't know. I think people like, you know, they're so used to seeing memes on Facebook that um, a big, like, flashy, some text and a picture helps, I think, to get those clicks. Um, we'll sometimes share from other Master Gardener pages like Orange County. Um, and sometimes I'll just share things saying, hey, remember to send your question to the office if you have a question. Because people will like post their question on Facebook instead of like just send it in. You know, and then someone will actually like look it up for you and send you an answer, it's kind of amazing. Um, so we, we're always looking for more help. Um, it's a lot of work <laughs> to do social media. Uh, so more people who want to send in photos, write little articles, um, they'll be amazing. Uh, we have a little training document that we use to train new people. Um, yeah, I don't know, is there anything, does anyone have questions? Or Ashley, do you have anything you want me to? No, I think the last, the last point's really, really great though, which is that um, if you haven't done this before, sometimes it can feel kind of daunting, but you guys are really, really excellent at kind of showing people how to do it, how to coordinate it, working with them, um, especially if you were interested in getting involved with this, but like, it's a lot, right? Um, there are a lot of times where we schedule posts around events using images we have. So maybe you start out by yeah. working on those posts where it's like known content, known image, and then you figure mm -hmm. out how to make a post and then you do the research. You know what I mean? You can kind of build your skills on this and the totally. committee is you can super pumped to help you do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if I could jump in, I sent uh, these guys some pictures of the first day that all of you guys showed up on January 5th and were talking outside and in some small groups. And Lila Tree did this amazing composite <laughs> of those pictures, made this little, uh, you know, composite. It was like a little collage, yeah. Collage, yeah. And it was, I couldn't have done the collage, but she did an amazing job with that yeah. and you posted up the fact that you guys had started um the training with us and that's a perfect also a perfect kind of uh example of stuff that can go on that's a great point too because like you were like oh these aren't very good but i was able to just kind of put them together you know and to put them in a little yeah a little you made a magic i love <laughs> it um and people love those pictures like people love people in photos and i know it's a little bit thorny because we have to make sure we or have permission for people who you know Maybe we're at a private event or something, but a public event usually uh, is fairly safe as long as it's like mostly their master gardeners in the pic picture or the backs of people's heads. Um, gray areas, right? But um, people do love, and people love like stuff about cocoa cinnamon, just like local interest, uh, human interest. People just love that stuff. We get a lot of clicks on that stuff. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's one great way to, to um, Get some hours and contribute, you know, to the mission. Really, um, I just I want to I want people to think about us as a way, a place they can go for answers. Like that's my sort of main driving um, approach. So like using Facebook to kind of be that thing that's always there, kind of shows up on their page once a day. You know, um, hopefully, it's doing a good job of that. Awesome. Do we just contact you if we're interested? Oh, or, you know? yeah. Um, let's see. We have. Gosh, thank you for for saying that. Uh, we have a, a an email address. And I'm just, I can't remember what it is. I think it's. Let me let me find it and put it in the chat, or just send it to Ashley. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can send a message to our Facebook page or to Instagram. Um, and there's also a page on the intranet with the contact information on there. Um, and then so that, if I can jump in, Layla, we, we are actually going to pass out to all of you in good. this class a quote unquote cheat sheet of <laughs> all of the committees and or other volunteer organizations and the contact name and email of people that can answer questions for you or give you more information and whatever it is you, you desire. That list is being finished okay. up as we speak. So everybody's going to get that towards the 
Yeah, probably in another couple of weeks. And so then that gives you a great additional source uh, for being able to contact someone if you have a question or want to try to jump in and have fun with them. Yeah, oh, awesome. Really. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's time to start like just posting pictures of, you know, little spring flowers that you see or whatever. So. <laughs> Those are always a hit, just yeah. like pictures people see. Like, you know, it can be just something you find interesting and then want to write a little bit about. Yeah. I always think people like that. So. Yeah, definitely. I just try to like anticipate what the questions are going to be. Like it's, you know, starting seeds, for example, something like that this time of year. Um, but whatever. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Lily Tree. That's yeah, sure. super helpful. Um, and so, yeah, so we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about the blog for a second, but just to know that um, I'm going to unshare. Yeah. Um, but so just so everyone knows, the blog and social media are two committees we have that um, are both, um, how do I say this, can, can use more support. Um, so Lolitri has really generously stepped up to be our chair this year, but I know she's looking at more support, wanting more support for that team, even though they're already doing a really great job. Um, it's one of those things where they do a great job because, you know, we are on their team. And so that can always help more. And I think it's probably, it started because of the pandemic, but I, I don't think it's going to stop at all that we have a lot of engagement through these forums. Like this is how we find a lot of people. This might be the first place that even some of you really saw us and interacted with us. And so it's kind of a really cool way for us to also reach audiences that don't know about extension already, which is really fun. Um, so I will share a little bit about the blog. This is the the other side of the coin. So Social media is really, really spectacular for um, kind of what I like to think of as intro level stuff, quick facts, fun things, fun ways for people to engage in kind of a, a short way or get little, you know, upcoming classes or whatever, right? Whereas the blog are longer form articles that allow people to kind of really do a dive into a topic. Um, and so our blog we've had for a number of years now. Um, this past year, we were actually publishing every week. We were led by a really excellent master gardener named Melinda Heigl, but she just moved to Raleigh. And so what are you going to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? She's She joined the Wake County Master Gardeners. Um, they're a good program, so we accept it, but not happily. And so the blog is a really great way to, if you like researching topics, if you like putting together stories, if you like kind of tracking down an idea, right? That's really where the blog shines. And it's a great thing for us as a resource, because not only do we get to put out these weekly blog articles that are really helpful, but it creates a library of those articles, right? And so that's kind of long-term content that people can find online and interact with. And it's amazing because when we look up old stats, we know there are articles that were written five or six years ago that are still getting active annual, like every year they get hit a lot, right? Like every year they become big again. And so in this past year, just kind of a quick intro, um, we had, so for 2022, we had, um, Melinda was so proud of us, this was her reach goal, we had 105, almost 106,000 um, blog views, that was by um, over 81,000 unique viewers, and each viewer tended to visit at least, um, it was 1.3 times, so that what that's saying is that we're finding a lot of new people, but there's also actually a lot of viewers who are looking at it pretty regularly. Um, and this is a really great source of kind of research-based um, information for people in North Carolina. And just to kind of share with you what the blog looks like, let me see if I can get to this. Ooh, too many screens. Okay. So our blog, I swear I try to be better about tabs than I am currently, but my life has just exploded. Um, so our blog, this is what it looks like right now. So we just had a great one on... Um, African violets. This is a fun one because it's actually a repost, which is really nice because again, when we find those really popular articles that maybe were put out three, four, five years ago, we tend to post them again and again. Um, so excellent pictures taken by Wendy. We do a monthly um, section that is gardening to do's done by Gary Crispel. Um, that's a delightful article that as everyone knows, like my favorite thing is the fact that Gary does the December issue uh, in verse, which I think is beautiful um, and really fun. We also have some tabs with long running information. Um, so last week when we you learned about tomato grafting, that was actually this tomato grafting tab on our blog. 
So this is all really, really kind of cool content, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, and this is something that really works because master gardeners work on it. And so if you're interested in writing blog articles or even learning to write blog articles, right, you can always contact me about that. We're, we're in transition. Like I said, you know, we need a new blog chair. We, we could use some more writers. We have some great ongoing writers who um, do an amazing job, but we can use some new folks. These don't have to be super long articles, right? What we're talking about is we're talking about three, four, or five paragraphs on a topic, maybe some pictures. We can help you learn how to find pictures and how to do all of this. Um, and it's it's really a fun way to learn more about a topic. Um, and I'll share the link to the blog, but if you have not checked out our blog, I would do it. It is pretty cool. And one of the fun things about it too is that now the blog team does work closely with the social media team. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of back and forth and talk about, you know, what are some of the good topics and how do we schedule posts to support each other and how do we do kind of all that work together, which is really cool too, because you're part of a larger kind of communication team. So I will say that um, if you're interested at all, if you want to learn how to do it, if you want to provide content, but maybe someone else does some of the formatting and some of that kind of stuff that you're not super into, right? Like we can engage in all those different ways. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Those are really, really great opportunities. And if you have, um, oh, and also, because I know we do have a couple of folks in the group who are into photography. Another thing you can always do to support those efforts, even if you're not super interested in, you know, doing the actual posting is if you have photos that you're willing to share, um, any pictures that you take or any content that you write, um, you can absolutely get volunteer hours for that. The one difficult thing that I will just say right up at the front, because I don't want anyone to get confused, is that um, if you um, take a bunch of pictures or you write a bunch of articles and you get volunteer hours for those articles, it does kind of work the way it would in a professional situation where then that that material does become um, NC State material. Um, and the reason for that is just because NC State doesn't want to have a bunch of pictures it's using that it doesn't actually control rights on. And so once you log hours for pictures, um, those become NC State material. But if you don't want to log hours and you want to keep the copyright for all your material, um, we can just credit them a little bit differently and we can figure out how to make that all work. So yeah, a lot of cool information. Um, does anyone have any questions about any of that? Awesome. Okay, so then the only other exciting news I have, and then we will be out about half an hour early, is that we have finally 90% um, guarantee that we're going to the soil lab for our break week. So um, that's March 16th. I will update the syllabus. Remember that is an optional field trip. It's a morning field trip. I'll have more details about it to come. But what we'll be doing is we'll be touring the um, NC State soil lab. And that's really cool because you'll get to see where they process soil samples and where they make a bunch of people sit in a room, count nematodes. Um, it's kind of a fun opportunity to see how all of that works. If you want to see some like fun large scale old school science with crazy machines. That is the time to do that. So with that, um, I will hang out and answer questions, but uh, we will see you guys next week when your projects are due. Bye everyone. Thanks, Lily Tree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley, this thank you. But this Sue, I have a question, quick question about the pro again about the project. But is it do you prefer that hard copy? Do you want it on a thumb drive? I mean, how what's your preference? Email it to you as a PD? World's your oyster. Um, if it's a okay. if it's a form that does print easily and you have a printer, print that is helpful for us. But um okay. if it's not or you don't, you know, we make it work. I have options. So I just want to know what was easiest for you guys. It sounds like if I can print it, that's easiest for you guys. Yeah. Right? Okay. Okay. Sounds, sounds like a plan. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. and, and if, and if it's not easy to print like a PDF or a link. Oh yeah. I don't own a you? printer. Just send it to us. Yeah. Just email yeah. it somehow. <laughs> to, to you. Yeah. To me. Yeah. Email it to me. If, if you, uh, if that's your, if that's your jam. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Absolutely. Thanks.
Awesome. All right. You guys are just the people who don't sign off because you're afraid a question will be asked. All right. I think we're good. <laughs> Bye, everyone.